Remembering Sophia, Psychology After the Red Book, and this last lecture, lecture is titled The Mysterium Conjunctionis. So, we now turn to a more hopeful subject, I hope. And this one has to do with the Sophianic myth and the mystery of Eros. The story of Sophia moves from an unknowable and only mystically effable archetype of primordial relationship into the Eros of human life. And let's, let's just start with that idea of Eros. In myth, is the image of Eros masculine or feminine? In myth. Fem- uh, masculine. Masculine. Yeah? Yeah. Psycheism. Hillman, quite correctly, in terms of Greek myth, argued that Eros is masculine. A masculine image. A son. And this played a part in the so-called men's movement. But Eros is obviously something women know a little bit about, too. It has feminine qualities, too. It has masculine qualities. And this is interesting because in the Gnostic mythology, Eros is much more complex In the Gnostic text from uh, Nag Hammadi on the origin of the world, it is told that the feminine power of Sophia, again called by the name Pronoia, forethought, also she's sometimes called Epinoia, the first feminine image, that Sophia poured out her light upon the earth. The text says... The earth upon which the light of Pronoia spread was called the holy adamantine earth. And the earth was purified because of the blood of the virgin. End quote. That's an interesting image. You know, the the Orthodox Christian myth speaks of sanctification, purification through the blood of Christ. Gnostic Christianity here offers an additional image. This image of the blood of the virgin purifying earth. Earth. The story continues, and I quote, Out of this first blood, Eros appeared. Eros is androgynous. His masculine side is Himeros, because he is fire from light. And his feminine side is a soul of blood from the substance of forethought, from Sophia. Eros is extremely handsome in appearance and more attractive than all the creatures of chaos. So, Himeros, a Greek name. Himeros is the god of desire, linked to Eros in Greek mythology. The masculine aspect of Eros is called in this Gnostic myth, Himeros. He is fire from light. Fire from light. The feminine side of this androgynous thing, the feminine side of Eros is called a soul of blood from substance of pronoia. The feminine image called forethought, Epinoia, Sophia. And those of you who know classic mythology, Greek mythology, will note the very different hermeneutic tone in these Gnostic myths. They are myths told to a consciously reflected purpose. They're sort of proto psychological. So Eros exists in masculine and feminine forms, and they are different. Isn't that interesting? One, fire from light. The other, soul of blood from substance of Sophia, of Pronoia. (coughs) 
So here we have male eros equals fire and light. Female eros equals soul of blood and substance. And remember that the Gnostic symbol of, uh, of which we've spoken earlier was that image of light and life. Crossing. Phos, light. Zoe, life. In that image, that cross we have an image of eros, light and life, androgynous. This eros, this union, this mystery of union, has androgyny, light and life, just like eros. There's something erotic in that image. So, is there in your experience or observation a difference in the eros known by men and the eros known by women? Is it rooted in differing psychological natures of male and female? Allowing for outliers. And liars, too. Whatever the difference in perspective, there seems to be a longing in both men and women for this relationship, a relationship. It involves instinctual sexual energies because, hey, we carry those energies. We're human. We're animals. We're from this earth. This earth. And we might remember the soul was sanctified. This earth was sanctified by the blood of the Virgin. Hmm? But it sometimes involves much more than our physical natures. Much more than our instinctual sexuality, or so it seems. It seems to involve something which can be magical. I think particularly around the middle of life, and for some people probably all their lives, some people find themselves consciously seeking some hidden spiritual factor in their sexuality in their relational sexuality, in their love relationships. They long for it, and the longing is, to my observation, usually disappointed, eventually, or frustrated. Eventually. You know, this mystery of of, of love at first sight A human mirrors back to us a love image. I remember falling madly in love with a woman on the metro in Paris in my younger years, much, much younger years. She got on. I looked at her and me, hey, Paris is full of very lovely women, in my opinion. Um, And and there are lots of them. This woman gets on the the subway and I immediately, it's just like, oh my God, this is her. It's like... And I was, and I wanted to look at her, but I didn't want to stare at her, because that would be rude, right? You know, even in Paris. And so, but I could see it, the metro was dark, and I could see her reflection in the mirror of the window. So I stared at her reflection in the window. I thought, "Geez." And then two stops later, she got off the metro, and that was the end of the story. Love. What did I see? Why? I mean, I ask myself that. What the hell? What was I supposed to do? Has that ever happened to any of you in some strange, perhaps less strange way? Oh, and then what was I doing? I was looking at her damn reflection in the window. I wasn't even looking at her. I was looking at the the reflection in the window because I didn't really want to stare at her. It's like, huh? What is it? What do we see? What do we see? that we just see what comes out of us. Because then, you know, sometimes these things happen. You go talk to the person, you go, oh, hi, you know, I'm here in Paris just visiting, and she tells you you're a jackass, and, to, you know, get lost. That's how life works most of the time for me. So, um, <clears throat> Are you sure it was seeing her and not something else? Not something else? Well, I think that it's male to think it's about sight. And I think that it's probably 
less female to see someone, a stranger, and fall in love. Uh -huh. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying I think that it's less likely that that's going to happen. I think sight is more important to men, but I also always wonder whether it's really sight or whether it's something else. Something, something else, huh? Something else. You know, they say everything is energy or mm -hmm. frequency. Mm -hmm. So you are operating at a certain frequency in your physicality, and this woman comes on the subway, maybe she's complementing a frequency between you, uh, sensitive versus intuitive, or what have you, or maybe she's matching a frequency that you don't find elsewhere. I don't know. It is a magic and we look for ways of explaining it. But it is a spell. It is. It is a magic spell. And is it me, more men than women? Well, you know what? I, uh, oh, no. No, no, I think that... You think the visual I part... I think there are magic spells. I just think that it might not happen on the spot as much for women. And maybe that has to do maybe with this anima idea, this idea that the male is looking for that female spirit. And that maybe that relationship, the eros of man, this fire and light, is different than the blood, soul, eros of woman? Is that possible? I mean, that was in the myth. Is that a metaphor? It's not a conceptual language. It's not a metaphysics. But it's what it's saying is that there, there's a difference. Eros is different. I fell in love <clears throat> with my husband, Lee, practically immediately. But I thought it was... Because he had this Jeep I loved. I never heard about the car. <laughs> Driving with the top down in January up to Alta. But he asked me to marry him about two weeks later. And we were married in May. We were married for 42 years. Did you keep the Jeep? We kept it for a very long time. <laughs> Well, the women want stability with Jeep. <laughs> and the men want, maybe if they're thinking of a good breed, breeding partner, they're looking for the physical. Somebody that can survive a trip to Alba in a Jeep with a top down. Yeah, and top down in yeah. January. <laughs> the craziest. I think it was a good idea. <laughs> so, a film from Sundance called I Origins that I just want to say. Say when you see it come out, you I think you like the joy. What's it called? I or I origins. <clears throat> e Y E or I? It, it, well, the, it, the title is I, but it's actually that. Uh, that's a good question. Yeah. Well, anyway, look, anima and animus. Jung's conceptual language mirrors his own experience, his journey into this imaginal realm. He wrote around 1950 in his essay on anima and animus that appears in his book Ion. He said, quote, It is not the concept that matters. The concept is only a word, a counter. And it has meaning and use only because it stands for a certain sum of experience. Unfortunately, I cannot pass on this experience to my public. Experience. And perhaps now with the publication of Libra Novus, in a sense he is finally passing on some of his experience to the public. But Jung's, Jung's conceptual language, you know, complexes, persona, shadow, these concepts refer to experiences we all can grasp. They are the doorway of the depths. Anima and animus in Jung's conceptual terminology are factors of deeper levels. They're deeper facts of life. And they are agents active in our human experience. The primal archetype of relationship, imaged in the relationship of Logos and Sophia, was actually reflected in Jung's conceptual language as anima and animus relationships. Jung was working not only on his experience of the imaginal realm when he was developing these conceptual labels. He was also reflecting, even at that early time, on the experience and accounts from the past and from Gnostic mythology. And it's interesting that in 1927, 
just as he was finishing his transcription or what he would transcribe into the Red Book, he wrote that the onymotype is represented in the most succinct and pregnant form in the Gnostic legend of Simon Magus. This Gnostic myth, this relationship of Simon as Logos with Helena as Sophia, he said this was the most succinct and pregnant form of the anima image. In his psychological commentary on anima and animus in Ion, Jung stated that the anima can be realized only through a relationship to a partner of the opposite sex. Anima. This is for a man he's talking about here. You see, Jung's a man. He's, a lot of his psychology has a very masculine tone. He's writing from his viewpoint. That the anima can only be realized through a relationship to a partner of the opposite sex. And this was, you know, the doorway for Dr. Jung. When Jung was done with this conceptual form of his psychology in, in oh, 1912 or so, before the Red Book stuff started, he was really, I don't know how to put this, an uptight sort of guy. I guess that'd be one way to put it. And what really broke down the doors to some of the material that came was a love relationship. He fell in love and entered into a relationship with a young woman by the name of Tony Wolfe. And this has always been a no-no in in his history because it was always an embarrassment to his children and grandchildren that this had happened. It was not easy for his wife, Emma, who stayed his wife all those years. But Jung did enter into this relationship with Tony Wolfe. I have a friend who's just finished a, a major biography of Tony Wolfe. And, you know, Tony's life, this love story was very real, but her life was not necessarily all that happy. She had a very difficult time. She stayed with Jung all those years, up through her death in the early 1950s. She was at Sunday dinner with the Jung family every Sunday throughout all those years. She really was a second wife to Jung. Um, Her children did not, I mean, Emma's children, Jung's children, did not really quite understand the nature of the relationship, but she knew she was just part of the family. She was always there. And when the children did realize the nature of the relationship in their young adult years, they were not happy. Now, Jung had one son and and daughters, and the daughters particularly were upset about this fact in their mother's life, Tony Wolf. It was not happy, and it was not happy for Tony in those last years of her life either. Although the relationship was intense, after the intensities of the first ten or so years, um, Jung and Tony did grow apart. They stayed in relationship, but they were not in this fantastic love relationship. It was just how it was. And uh, they basically, Emma and Tony shared companionship with Jung pretty regularly for many, many years. But at this doorway, Tony really was the one who opened it. He said, Jung said to his soul in 1913, uh, when this all was getting going, when he was first entering this stage of petitioning communication with his soul, he said, I met you again, the soul, only through the soul of the woman. His relationship with Tony, or with the woman, unnamed in the diaries, was something that broke him open to some of this internal material. This is a fact. This happened. And Jung would look back later at other stories in history, and he would see that love relationships sometimes were entries into the mystery of the soul. He felt it was a doorway for many, for many others. And this included... Who else but Simon Magus, who had found Helena, Sophia, in Gnostic myth? And one must, of course, remember that Jung identified his guru, his spirit guide, Philemon, as having been Simon Magus. And what did he say of Simon Magus? Simon was a lover of the soul. Philemon was a lover of the soul. He, too, Jung, was a lover of the soul. In the 1930s, Jung related how great poetic creations such as The Shepherd of Hermas, The Divine Comedy, and Faust all, and I quote, relate relate a primary love episode which culminates in visionary experiences. 
we find the undisguised personal love episode not only connected with the weightier visionary experience, but actually subordinated to it. Unquote. And of course, you know, Dante's love for Beatrice, for, Be, you know, Beat, for Beatrice, is that how you say it in English? Beat, Beatrice? Beatrice, yes. Um, that was an image that opened this doorway, this poetic imagination. So last month I introduced this Gnostic story of, of Simon Magus and Helena. By 1917, Jung had identified Philemon with, his, uh, Philemon with this ancient Simon. And it was part of his developing myth, the story he was hearing. And Jung had read the Gnostic tales of Simon at that date. And he pondered this relationship between Philemon, his imaginal guide, and this ancient Simon, an historical figure. Temporally, Simon's revelation probably took form during the same period that Gnostic myth of Sophia was being heard. This was all 2,000 years ago. It was contemporary with the story of Jesus of Nazareth. It went on to produce its own independent textual tradition. But in the creative imagination of that age, 2,000 years ago, these myths of Sophia and Simon and Christ all had intimate relationship. Gnostic myth, I haven't talked much about the Christ myth in Gnosticism, but that was all hooked up with this Sophia myth. It was all together. It was all part, working together, in the imaginal constructs of that age. Simon's story tells a myth parallel to the story of Sophia, but uses a slightly different set of images. In Simon's myth, This feminine power, like Sophia, has descended into cosmos. She is indwelling in creation, in earth, in flesh. Simon interprets himself as the one sent to find her. Simon takes on the role of the Logos in this rendition of the tale. He is the mortal man upon whom the Logos has descended, and his task is to rescue her. Epinoia, Sophia, his primal syzygy, from a realm that does not recognize her presence. And he finds her in a mortal woman, who is Helena in this Gnostic myth. And Simon's myth is a peculiar mirror image of the Christ story. In Simon's myth, the redemptive act occurs not through his death by crucifixion, but through his announcement of the feminine divine image indwelling in this world. She, the feminine twin aeon of the Logos, is the one hanging on the four formed cross of matter. Simon, in the role of a redeemer, recognizes her. He historically meets her in a woman named Helen. And, of course, where does Simon meet this Helen? Supposedly, they said of him, he met her in a back alley of the city of Tyre where she was a prostitute. Helen was at that moment a prostitute in bondage, the most debased of human things. But in this woman, a thing of no worldly honor, Simon recognized the Sophianic figure, his primal bride. So, in the broader mythic vocabulary of the age, the feminine image, she, she is not only named Sophia. It is the great light on the cross of matter, the mystery indwelling fleshly life, flesh. She is the supernal mother of life. Jung uses the term anima mundi frequently. The Latin word means world soul. Anima mundi. Sophia in Gnostic myth is the anima mundi. She is the essential prima materia imagined and sought by the later alchemical tradition. She is hidden somewhere in the slag and dross. She is the treasure buried in the field. She is the one abandoned on the dung heap. She is everywhere. And yet she is so seldom truly seen. But of course, this image of syzygies in relation, gender relationships, if we use a physical metaphor of duality, this image is also manifest in the Jesus tradition as well. Where? 
You know, in these talks, as I said, I haven't talked about the Gnostic tradition of the story of Christ. It was a story of Sophia that I needed for you to remember in this set of lectures. But let me turn briefly to his myth and how the Gnostics read it, or at least one part of it. The principal disciple beside Jesus in most Gnostic myths is Mary of Magdala. And among all the stories emerging from the Gnostic Gospels in our age, this is the one that has, at this moment in history, aroused an incredible libido in the collective psyche. And I use libido in the sense of energy. Um, I, I run this internet site. 20 years ago, I had a vision of putting all these Gnostic texts that were, at that point, very hard to find in a place where they were accessible when the internet started. And now it's become a major library, and it gets used. It gets over, you know, these documents are accessed something like 8 million times a year by various people all over the world. Um, the text, month after month, for the last 15 years, the one text at the top of the hit list is the Gospel of Mary. The Gospel of Mary Magdalene. That's what people come looking for. Month after month after month, thousands, tens of thousands of times, people come looking for this text. The text itself is fragmentary. The text, when it was found, it was found around 1898 in Egypt. When the text was found, it was probably intact, but somehow as it hit the black market, it got torn apart, and the first several pages, and then several pages out of the middle of the text, were lost. They, they may still be out there somewhere. They may yet be found. And what remains is fragmentary. And I don't know what most readers get out of reading the Gospel of Mary of Magdala as it exists, as it is extant, as I have it represented on the Internet. Um, you really have to understand the whole Gnostic mythos to be able to fill in the blanks and see what's going on. But that is what they come looking for. And you know when it really took off? When people really started? Huh? With the Yeah, the Da Vinci Code. When the Da Vinci Code hit, uh, it was just phenomenal. I mean, it's like my, you know, my website statistics, I, I don't look at these things every, you know, every minute or every day, but I do look at the reports. I can just click on a link and see what's happening. It just went, whew. I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of people looking for the Gospel of Mary, Mary of Magdala, looking for information about this lost story of the feminine, the feminine in the Christ story. Isn't that interesting? Because you see, in Gnostic mythology, that story was always part of the story. It was part of the story of Simon and Helen, who were you know, this, this companion pair to the Mary Magdalene and Jesus story. So, and now again we have it. Did Jesus have a wife? Or a girlfriend? Well, you know, in the the Gnostic Gospel of Philip, found at Naj Hammadi, we have an enticing image of this relationship. And it starts with actually an invocation of Sophia's name. Let me read you this entire text. It starts with this invocation. Sophia, who is called barren, is the mother of angels. And then after that sentence, it starts, the companion of the Savior is Mary of Magdala. Now, isn't that interesting? It starts with this invocation of Sophia. Sophia, who is called barren, is the mother of angels, angelos, messengers. Messengers, right? Who is called... Who, yeah, Sophia, who is called barren. 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 Okay. Without child. She's called the one without child. Okay? But she is the mother of angels. Angelos. Messengers. Oh, and what was Mary of Magdala called? Apostola. Mary of Magdala was called Apostola Apostolorum. In Latin, it means the apostle, the messenger to the messengers. Apostola Apostolorum. Because Mary Magdala is the one who came to the tomb and first met the risen Lord. She was the one who took the message of the resurrection to the other messengers. She was the first messenger. Isn't that interesting? So, the companion of the Savior is Mary of Magdala. 
The Savior loved her more than all the other disciples, and he kissed her often on her mouth. The other disciples said to him, Why do you love her more than all of us? The Savior answered and said to them, Why do I not love you like her? And then it it completes with this phrase. If a blind person and one who can see are both in darkness, they are the same. When the light comes, one who can see will see the light, and the blind person will stay in darkness. That's how the Lord answers those who ask, Why do you not love us like you love her? Actually, in the text, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say um, the companion of the Savior is Mary of Magdala, the Lord, the Savior loved her more than all the others and kissed her often on her mouth. What it says is the Lord loved her more than all the others and kissed her often on her blank. (laughs) Because in the Coptic text, a little piece of papyrus right where that word is got lost. So what it really says is the Lord kissed her on her blank. And you can fill in the blank any way you want. The Kissed her on her birthday. You see, it's possible. And I actually gave this, when I, I gave this story in, in Zurich, and a lady in the uh, audience who was very orthodox complained, no, 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 it was his, her hand, her hand. Okay, how can I argue? There's a hole there. It was on her blank. But, Which of the Gospels talks about Jesus actually breathing into the mouth of Mary? Is that the gospel of Philip? I don't remember that. So, so the myth told by the Gnostics do not identify Mary as a girlfriend or a wife of Jesus, at least in any of our colloquial ways of understanding such relationship. They say Mary of Magdala was a chief disciple, a chief companion. And Jesus kissed her often on her mouth. The relationship exposed in that text, when contextualized with other surrounding material, implies that Mary Magdalene was both a symbolic and a real figure in the story of Jesus. She was the Apostola Apostolorum, the messenger to the other apostles. In Gnostic exegesis, her story was true, even if it became fictive. You see, fictive facts can be true. Stories can be true. Imaginal elements of the story were important Gnostic facts. This is mythologizing mysticism, as Carigny called it. It grants reality both to story and to history, inner and outer facts wed. So Simon and Helen are, in, are a variation and transmutation of the image of Christ and the Magdalene. At the beginning of the Christian aeon, both stories, Simon's story and Jesus' story and Helen's story and Mary Magdalene's story, played together within Gnostic imagination, just as they then played outwardly upon the stage of history. the bridal chamber mystery in the gospel of Philip so in conclusion to this series of lectures I have to now turn to the mystery and it was a human mystery a divine mystery, a mystery of life it is a primary focus of the gospel of Philip one of the many important texts that were found at Naj Hammadi and I should add Dr. Jung never saw this text this was discovered and translated was discovered during his life, but the translation was later. He did not see this text. The mystery I speak about is called the mystery of the bridal chamber. And some readers, some scholars, suggest that all of the Gospel of Philip is a commentary on this ultimate mystery of the Valentinian Gnostic tradition. In Philip, in the text of Philip, it is stated. 
that the master, as he's called, offered five symbolic or sacramental mysteries. And here is the key text, and I'll quote from the Gospel of Philip. The master did everything in a mystery, a baptism, a chrism, a Eucharist, a redemption, and a bride chamber. A baptism, a chrism, a Eucharist, a redemption, and a bride chamber. Those are the mysteries. Orthodox tradition <clears throat> retained the first three of these ritual mysteries. Baptism is, of course, the rebirth in water. Chrism or confirmation is the anointing with fire of the Holy Spirit in form of oil. And Eucharist is the symbolic sacrifice and union of bread and water and wine. But the last two mysteries mentioned in the Gospel of Philip, a text which dates probably back into the second century, remains just that. Mysteries. It has been conjectured that the mystery of redemption was liberation, that gnosis, that knowledge provided from bondage to the demiurge, a release from the archonic powers that can hold us. It was the spirit of that times, the ruler of the world. And, you know, that, that seems plausible. The bridal chamber was the final mystery, and it remains just so to us today. It seems to have been an experience. An experience. Let me read a few sections from the Gospel of Philip that comment on this event called the mystery of the bridal chamber. And again, take this as a psychology, talking about human experience. I quote, In this world where strength and weakness are to be found, there is union of male and female. But in the eternal realm, there is a different kind of union. Although we, re- although we refer to these things with the same words, there are also other words that are superior to every word that is pronounced. These are above strength. For there is strength, and then there are those superior to strength. And they are not different, but the same. This is incomprehensible to hearts of flesh. There are different ways of talking about these things. We use these words, metaphors of male and female. And although we refer to these things with the same words, there are other words that we really even cannot speak that refer to these realities, these dualities, these sexualities in erotic union. Okay? The separation of male and female was the beginning of death. Christ came to heal the separation that was from the beginning and reunite the two in order to give life to those who died through separation and unite them. And another text. And this section begins with a bold proclamation. It starts saying, it is necessary to utter a mystery. It is necessary to utter a mystery. That's what this says. And then this text follows. The Father of all united the Virgin who came down And fire shone on him. On that day, that one revealed the great bridal chamber. On that day, he came forth from the bridal chamber as one born of a bridegroom and a bride. He came forth from the bridal chamber as one born from a bridegroom and a bride. So Jesus established all within it. And then these are the concluding words of the Gospel of Philip. If one becomes an attendant of the bridal chamber, that one will receive the light. For those who receive the light cannot be seen or grasped. Nothing can trouble such people even while they are living in this world. And when they leave this world, they have already received truth through images. And the world has become the eternal realm. To these 
people, the eternal realm is fullness. This is the way it is. It is revealed to such a person alone. Hidden not in darkness and night, but hidden in perfect day and holy light. That's the end of the Gospel of Philip. In Gnostic tradition, this final mystery appears to be a holy wedding, a heros gamos, a mysterium conjunctionis. It was the mystery of the bridal chamber, a union of two natures, imaged by male and female, but those words do not quite hold hold the entirety of the words meant. Light and life, Jesus and Mary, Simon and Helen, mind and image, nous and epinoia, Two things, two things, wed, unified, touching in this life, inner and outer. Jung kept talking about opposites, the unification of opposites, two worlds. This is the wedding of worlds. And it says that he who experiences such a thing... has received truth through images. Isn't that interesting? Elsewhere it says, Truth did not come into the world naked, but through the types and images. Truth did not come naked, but in the types and images. Another text from the Gospel of Philip. And let me then just and with a story about Dr. Jung. You know, we've talked maybe just in passing here about near-death experiences. <clears throat> Jung had a near-death experience. In 1944, he nearly died. Jung had gone into this event of the Red Book, 1914, 1915, 1917. Some of these images had been playing with him including this image of a wedding, a bridal chamber. He had met it, not these texts, he didn't know these, but there are other implications of this in Gnostic literature. And he had been engaged in this relationship with his soul on the inside, with a woman on the outside. All of this mystery was mixing up, and there was eros, there was love involved in it. And that should not be forgotten, that is part of what sustained Jung in this journey. And he ended this period curious about the mystery of the hero scombs. This image in the history of Christianity, of the West, of Judaism, in the mystery of the Shekinah, which Ken Kimmel will be talking about. This vessel of the presence of the divine in this world that the Kabbalist was supposed to join with. And not only was the Kabbalist supposed to meet and join with the Shekinah and maybe even bring about Tikkun, a a redemption by gathering the sparks of her light in this world, but actually the Kabbalist was supposed to be the Shekinah, be himself penetrated. He was the vessel of the presence of the divine. He was the feminine thing, and he was to actually be penetrated by the divine. He was to take the role of the feminine as well as the masculine. A flip there, okay? That this image played across thousands of years of mysticism. He talks about things like Dante and his relationship with the feminine. Jung found this image in the alchemical tradition, which probably fell the alchemical tradition connected to Gnostic myth was very important to Jung. He felt that alchemical tradition was connected to Gnostic myth. If alchemy was connected to Gnosticism, it was probably to the tradition of Simon Magus, of Simon and Helena, of this feminine that had been denied, refused, left on the dung heap, called a prostitute, called the bitch. Because that's how alchemy talked about this prima material that was in the earth that we had to extract. 
and we had to wed. There was all these images of the heroes gamos and alchemy, and Jung had become very, very interested in this stuff. Why was he interested in it? <clears throat> what was he trying to talk about? He was trying to talk about an experience, a human experience that he felt was key. And then what did he go looking at? In Eastern mysticism, Kundalini, Tantra, the union of feminine and masculine energies. He went looking at Chinese mysticism in Taoism, yin and yang, and the Tao, the union. <clears throat> These were his concerns. And he, at that time, in 1942, Jung started working on a book that he thought would be his opus magnum, his last work, his great work, the summary of all of his life's work. And you know what he titled it in 1942? Mysterium Conjunctionis, the mystery of the conjunction. He started writing it. <clears throat> he didn't finish it for many years to come. But he started. And in 1944, in February, first week of February, this week, Dr. Jung took a walk near his house up the hill in Kusnak and slipped on the ice and broke his ankle and hobbled off to a house, called a cab, was taken to his home, and he'd broken his fibula, his ankle. It was not all that bad. They put a cast on. The cast was probably a little bit too tight. Dr. Jung was immobilized. They told him, you know, you're an old man now. He's, he's, he's almost, you know, in his 60s. My God, he's ancient. And, uh, and uh, they put a cast on. The cast was a little bit too tight. And, of course, he sat there smoking his pipe undoubtedly all the time. I mean, what would a good gentleman do in a circumstance? And he developed a blood clot in his leg. And the blood clot broke loose and caused a pulmonary embolism. And 12 days later, Jung nearly died. There was no treatment for a pulmonary embolism in that day. There were no blood thinners. No one knew about aspirin or any of that stuff. And <laughs> there was no treatment. And you just watched. Do people live? Do people die? Jung nearly died. It was a huge embolism. And he laid in bed there in the hospital, nearly dead, and he had visions, the most incredible visions of his life. They altered the man. They changed the rest of his life's work. Let me read you about that. He said, The visions and experiences were utterly real. There was nothing subjective about them. And these, these words are all in memories, dreams, reflections in his uh, memoir. In the first vision of three, he found himself in the mystical Kabbalistic wedding of the Shekinah, the wedding of Tifereth and Malkuth, of the higher powers and the present power of Malkuth, of Shekinah, of the feminine, of the Sophia. And he says, I cannot tell you how wonderful it was. At bottom, it was I myself. I was the marriage. And my beatitude was that of a blissful wedding. There followed a second vision, and he goes on. There followed the marriage of the Lamb in Jerusalem, festively bedecked. I cannot describe what it was like in detail. These were ineffable states of joy. Angels were present and light. And I myself was the marriage of the Lamb. That too vanished. And there came a new image. The last vision. I walked up a wide valley to the end. There a gentle chain of hills began. The valley ended in a classical amphitheater. It was magnificently situated in green landscape. And there in this theater, the hero Skamos was being celebrated. The journey that had started in Libra Novus with Jung's petition to his soul, whom he found again only through the soul of the woman, was reaching a consummation, a wedding. 
This woman he had met in flesh and in image. She had offered herself in the form of Salome as his bride. He had followed the trail of that elusive mystical wedding across the ages. And now his story had reached its experiential conclusion. Jung had entered into the bridal chamber. He had met the bride. He was neither bridegroom nor bride. He said, I was the marriage. Jung was an empiricist, empiricist, or so he repeatedly claimed. He says he would have never believed such an experience was possible. But this, he said, was real. Jung had circumambulated this experience for 40 years in his work, in his curiosity, and now he knew. Barbara Hanna, a close associate, said later that these near-death experiences really changed Jung. This event reoriented his work, and it reoriented his hermeneutics. Jung was an empiricist, and he sought witness for his subjective experience in history. That is how one worked with the subjectivity of the psyche and built a scientific psychology. The prior hermeneutic expression of experience was necessary evidence for his psychology. Where was the witness of this experience? Where was it? In his last four great works, his last quartet, as I call them, the works published after 1944, Jung returned to enunciating the myth and the message of Libra Novus. This was a witness of experience. And all of his last works circled this one great mystery, this one central subject, the mystery of the conjunction. You know, Jung's work has been called a theology or compared to theology. Well, I don't get it. I don't get that. He's not working with ideas, just ideas. He's working with human experiences. Experiences of union, of love, of relationship. In remembering Sophia, and remembering this tale of the dead, my intention was to draw your attention back to relationship. Our relationship with life, with flesh, with the events of life, with arrows, with love, and with pain, with its sorrows. In bringing our life spirit to this life, to this fact, we're seeking actually a union, a consciousness. It is a type of wedding, and we are the bridal chamber of that wedding. That's how Jung saw it. The self was not a concept for Jung. The self was the fact of this wedding, this chamber of union, this fact that knew a thing before and after life, and knew life as living in us and through us. We were the wedding of mysteries. Mysterium conjunctionis. I think really unless you understand that experience, and the experience is the Red Book, one will not understand the work of CGU. It was more than psychology. It was humanity. It was a memory, a memory of humanity, and also a memory of our dead. They live with us, through us. We have responsibilities to this day, to their memory, to them. So thank you, folks. Appreciate your help.